So that the luxury of the ball, the, the, the gratified rich people that she sees around her, so they even look healthier, she thinks, makes such an impression on Emma. And then as she leaves, um, uh, she, she has these shoes. And you remember this passage, I hope. Well, it's a page 48 in, in my edition. It's, it's, at the, it's at the very end of, of chapter 8 uh, in uh, part 1. Reverently, she put away in the chest of drawers her, her beautiful dress and even her satin shoes, whose soles had been yellowed by the slippery wax of the dance floor. Her heart was like them. Contact with wealth had laid something over it that would not be wiped away. Contact with wealth, wealth had laid something over it which would not be wiped away. And this is really the, the, the beginning of Emma's corruption, if you will, um, uh, uh, because her desires cannot be satisfied. And so she continues to pursue desires that cannot be satisfied, which lead her further and further away from any possibility of satisfaction or happiness. What, is, what do they want, these two characters, Charles and Emma? Let's look at page 52 for what Charles wants. Charles, what does he want? Um, uh, Charles, at the bottom of 52, this is chapter 9 in part 1. Um, but Charles had no ambition. A doctor from Ivo, with whom he had recently found himself in consultation, had humiliated him. Charles didn't care. Charles had, he didn't want anything. <laughs> he had what he needed to be happy. A beautiful wife, that going to have a, a, a little girl. He had a medical practice. He, he was satiated, right? Charles had what he wanted. He, he didn't, uh, which was at this point, nothing. Emma, by contrast, deep in her soul, page 53, the next page, deep in her soul, however, she was waiting for something to happen. Like a sailor in distress, she would gaze out over the solitude of her life with desperate eyes, seeking some white sail in the mists of the far-off horizon. She did not know what this chance event would be, what wind would drive it to her, what shore it would carry her to, whether it was a long boat or a, or a three-deck vessel. Each morning, though, when she awoke, she hoped it would arrive that day. She was waiting for something to tear her, turn her life upside down. She, was, she wanted change. She wanted tumult. And eventually she gets um, uh, Charles to move to a new town, hoping to find it there. But instead she finds these strange characters, and we'll spend a little bit of time uh, on them now. Uh, uh, the most... Uh, in some ways fascinating and boring, and boring, I have to admit, is Homé, right? Remember, Homé uh, is the pharmacist. And Homé represents the Enlightenment figure in the book. He is the Enlightenment figure in the book. He represents the Enlightenment. He, uh, he's always talking about reason and Voltaire and uh, progress, and he is a bore. <laughs> he is always... Yeah, well, well, let's see, the first time we meet him, I think, is uh, on page 64, when they first arrive, uh, he, makes this long, uh, 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 he makes a long speech uh, about um, uh, 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 temperature, centigrade, Fahrenheit. Um, um, he, he is, um, he is uh, a case of uh, uh, misplaced intelligence and um, uh, uh, joined with overconfidence and um, an incredible uh, capacity to, to bore, uh, bore other people. Um, uh, so here we are. They're arriving, the Bovary's arriving in Yonville, and he's uh, uh, a man in green leather slippers, his skin slightly pitted by smallpox, wearing a velvet cap with a gold tassel, was warming his back at the fireplace. His face expressed nothing but self-satisfaction. <laughs> That's homemade. And he seemed as much at peace with life as the goldfinch suspended above his head in a wicker cage. This was the pharmacist. And the pharmacist throughout the book um, is, is uh, given to these long speeches uh, that say nothing but in more and more intellectual, quote unquote, terms. Um, so his chief characteristics uh, are 
um, a, a commitment to rationality uh, that makes him completely unreasonable and silly. Um, Léon, on the other hand, she meets right away as a young clerk, remember? And Léon is in some ways Homais' opposite because um, while the Homé is talking to Charles about uh, chemistry and uh, the latest uh, pseudoscientific things, uh, Léon and, and, and Emma start talking about uh, sunsets and uh, he's, Léon's a young man with fair hair um, and uh, big eyes um, and uh, the, the, um, uh, here's how their first conversation goes. Uh, uh, let, let's, let's take it up on page 70, which is in chapter two of part two. Um, um, one is, uh, are you tired, he asks her, because she had the stagecoach ride. I always find disruption interesting, <laughs> Emma says. I like a change of scene. And it's such a dismal thing, sighed the clerk, always to be stuck in the same place. Um, and then uh, um, Madame Bovary, skipping a little bit. But there's nothing more charming, it seems to me, Leon went on addressing Madame Bovary, when one can do it. Um, that is to go and to uh, ride around on, on a horse, and then they go on and, and Madame Bovary says to Léon, do you have any nice walks in the area? Um, oh, very few, he answered. There's a place they call the pasture at the top of the hill by the edge of the forest. I go there sometimes on Sundays and stay there with a book watching the sunset. I like nothing as much as a wonderful sunset, says Emma, <laughs> especially at the seaside. Now, now for Flaubert, he is gagging while he writes this. He's looking <laughs> in his, under the desk. He sees this as two limping romantics, bored out of their skulls, exchanging cliches that should be on greeting cards, but is the tool of seduction. There's nothing as wonderful as the sunset, especially the seaside. Oh, I love the sea. <laughs> And doesn't it seem to you that one spirit roams more freely over that limitless expanse and that contemplating it elevates the soul and gives one a glimpse of the infinite and the ideal? <gasps> Have you taken modern Christian theology? No, wait, that's not. <laughs> it's the same with mountain scenery. It's, I mean, so it goes on and on and on. That the, the, the exchange of romantic seduction. Um, um, and... Um, and it takes a long time for this to be consummated, right? And um, Flaubert gets a lot of trouble. He actually, the book goes on trial, as you probably know, because mostly, I think, because of the scene where she says in the church, the church seemed like one big boudoir. And they, she and, and Leon, later in the novel, uh, will go into a, a carriage and, and um, have sex for, for an awfully long time. <laughs> because the guy driving the thing gets crazy. Uh, 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 but uh, at this point, he's still, it's still greeting cards. He's still, he's still um, tra in training. So you see these two kindred souls, the kind of uh, super superficial romanticism is really the picture uh, that Flaubert is pointing of, a painting of, of them. Um, they, 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 and they have this infatuation throughout this part of the novel where Léon's too timid to really put the moves on her, and she keeps waiting for him, but in a way she's like, well, he really must love me because he doesn't touch me. I must love him because we can't consummate our relationship. And they have this, this wonderfully, uh, uh, f uh, wonderful fantasy about being uh, in love. But into the picture comes Rodolphe, a man of action and as well as fantasy, and a cruel character, an aristocrat who uh, has no function as an aristocrat. He is just pretty wealthy, spends his money on uh, parties and women, and... Um, he comes for the first time to the Bovary's household uh, for, for uh, uh, one, of his, uh, one of his men, one of his peasants who wor works for him, uh, needs to be bled. And so the first time they see him, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's having his man bled. And that ble is kind of a foreshadowing that he's going to leave a bloody mess when he leaves because he's uh, such a cruel person. Uh, Rodolphe will um, uh, seduce um, uh, Emma Bovary and famously at the agricultural fair. And uh, as you recall, in, in that section of the, of the novel, there's a fair that comes to town, a kind of what we would say in the United States is a county fair where people from all around the countryside bring their animals, bring their, their, 
the, the, the things they make that they, they might win prizes and and uh, up on stage they're giving medals to just to servants you know there's 50 years of service for being a good a good peasant a good uh, servant in a household and they're making these pompous speeches on and on about this while uh, in the background uh, Rodolphe is seducing um, seducing uh, Emma and so we go alternate back and forth from the, the, the officials uh, talking nonsense, really, ta uh, baloney, we would say, or worse, uh, to about the virtues of service while wrote office giving baloney, uh, nonsense, seductive prose to Emma about how they should actually belong in each other's arms. And Rudolph doesn't really care. All he wants to do is screw Emma. And all the bourgeois wants, the bourgeoisie wants to do is screw the peasantry. The bourgeoisie does it, economically speaking. Sorry for the vernacular, but this is literature. You need to use the full range of expression sometimes, or at least part of it. But the, the woman who comes up for 50 years of service, she has been abused, if you prefer, for 50 years. She has been, she has been, and now she's getting a little medal, which she's going to give to the priest. And Rudolph is saying, sweet nothings to Emma, because all he wants is to, is to have sex with her. And so they're just, they're just like, they're just two levels of, of seduction, if you will, but it's a crap, a verbal crap being slung by people who know how to manipulate other people. She resists him. She says she loves to be the attention. He is quite handsome. Um, uh, she is uh, he, uh, 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 delighted at the attraction. And then he, but he, but he's not going to live only in his head. Rudolph wants to sleep with her. He, he wants to seduce her. And um, she is beautiful. And he is a man who gets bored, so he seduces women. And remember, though, why she eventually decides, okay, I'll go off with him. And uh, it's very comical, in, 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 as Flaubert sets it up, because uh, Rodolphe says, it wouldn't be good for, uh, for Madame Bovary to go horseback riding. And she's like, oh, no, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. And, and Charles says, oh, yes, that would be good for you. That would be good for you. And I'll get you a horse, honey. And Rodolphe is, you know, you, you can imagine, yeah, <laughs> uh, waiting for the moment to take her into the woods on horseback. And she says, no, no. And then um, finally what, what, what changes her mind is, won't I need more clothes to go to start riding? Won't I have to get a riding outfit? And, oh, yes, you would need a riding outfit. Oh, she says, okay, well, um, sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. And so she, I bet she looks good in her leather breeches, it's, uh, or boots and breeches and whip and hat. Uh, this is uh, uh, Emma off to ride into the woods with Rodolphe, and, and I won't read you the scene, the steamy scene where he finds them a little spot and they become lovers, uh, but I will read you uh, from uh, uh, page 142, uh, Emma's response, because she comes back. She comes back from her tryst in the woods and she, uh, she looks at herself in the mirror, and she says um, again and again, I have a lover, I have a lover. Now, there, is, there are no notations for music here, so I guess I should just say, I have a lover, I have a lover, reveling in the thought as though she had come into a second puberty, Flaubert writes. At last she would possess those joys of love, that fever of happiness of which she had despaired. She was entering something marvelous in which all was passion, ecstasy, and delirium. Now notice the, the way Philbert writes that. She was entering something marvelous in which all was passion, ecstasy, and delirium. It's the third person, she, but it's really how Emma sees herself. And this is typical of Flaubert's style, sometimes called the free indirect style, where he has a, a point of view that is internal to Emma, but expressed in this third person. She was entering something marvelous in which all was passion, ecstasy, and delirium. 